What is up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Flippin' Bats, and I am joined today by Mike Yastrzemski, outfielder for the San Francisco Giants. Pumped to have him back on. The guy is a legend, and I always love having him on, talking to him. And this year is great. Got to talk to him about the rules. We'll talk to him all about that and his surprising thoughts on them and how much they've helped him so far this year. Obviously, his grandpa is an absolute legend, Carl Yastrzemski, and being able to have a good conversation with him about our last names and what it's meant to us in our lives and some adversity and some positives about it, really cool conversation there, uh, as well as had to ask about Barry Bonds. Left-handed hitting outfielder in the Giants organization. The comparisons are uncanny between the two of them. So just asking if he's talked to him about hitting and, and what he's learned from him as well as some other legends in the organization itself. This really is an awesome conversation and I'm excited to have him on and excited for you all to hear it. So without further ado, let's welcome him in now, outfielder for the Giants, Mike Yastrzemski. It's a blowout, eighth inning, 10-3. Bases are loaded for Verlander who waits out a three -hole. He swings, and it's a high fly ball, deep center field. It is gone. Home run. And a huge bat flip to celebrate. All right, Ben, start the show already. All right, and I am pumped now to bring back on friend of the pod, Mike Yastrzemski. Mike, thanks so much for joining me, my friend. Anytime, man. Thanks for having me. Of course. Hey, I want to start with this year for you guys and, and you personally. Off to a good start early in the season. And so far in, in your career, you know, your career got off to a, a great start. Now you're hitting well, but there was a couple year period in there where by your standards, not what we've been accustomed to from you. And this year, it seems like you're off to a good start swinging the bat. Well, what are some things this off season that you really focused on? Honestly, I just went back to thinking about being more of like a pure hitter again. Yeah. You know, I went through this phase where it was kind of important for me to show off a little bit of power mm -hmm. and it was at a time where that was what people were after in the game and so I adjusted my swing for that and it kind of got me the exposure and a little bit of the success that I needed to establish myself and with that I kept like going further and further down that line of trying to hit more homers and it just created a lot of miss hits a lot of strikeouts um and it just frustrated me. Yeah. You know, I, I knew I was a better hitter than that. And so I just really focused on the fundamentals of putting the barrel on the ball and being really consistent with, you know, my angles to the ball. It really is interesting now hearing you talk about it. The game kind of went to the three true outcomes. It's gotten more and more and more that way every single year. Home run, strikeout, walk, obviously mm -hmm. with these rule changes. But I, off the top of my head, didn't think of you as a guy that this could really benefit but thinking about it you're a lefty you can hit the ball on the ground a little more now do you think these new rules benefit you I think so yeah um <clears throat> you know there was some crazy stat where I saw at the end like you know they have those like wild like who gets shifted the most who hits into the shift the most yeah. and um you know me and Jock were both really high up on the wow. list of guys that were like extremely shifted and <laughs> also guys that hit into the shift a lot so uh, hopefully, you know, we've got a small sample size. I've seen a few ground balls go through, but, um, you know, it's also baseball. I've hit some line drives right at the shortstop where, you know, when it was the shift, it would have been a base hit. And now, yeah. <laughs> now it wasn't. It's gotta be so weird rolling over a ball to the right side and to getting through and being like, something just feels off here. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it hadn't happened in like five years. And then <laughs> all of a sudden there's a runner on first base and you're like, Oh my gosh, I forgot that like hitting a ground ball pull side used to be a really good thing when you were a lefty. <laughs> how have you this year, I, I've talked to kind of everybody to get a feel for how they feel about the rules. And first guy I had on this year was Dylan Cease, who had just thrown his opening day start. And he said from a pitcher's perspective, at first he was very apprehensive, now loves them, had a couple of hitters on. So aside from the shift being at play here, just speaking of the pitch clock in itself, where do you stand on that and how have you adjusted to it? I, I actually like it a lot. Um, I, at first it was, it took me a minute to get used to it, but it was on, it, honestly, it's the kind of play that Corbs loves. Yeah. And so going through college, like that's what I was used to is like play fast, make the other team uncomfortable. And 
you know, be comfortable in that scenario. So that way he used to talk about four seconds. So four seconds is an elite runner from home to first. And he's like, if you can make four seconds seem slow, then you're going to slow the game down. Everything's going to feel a lot slower. And so that's kind of what I was used to for a long time. And now it's gotten back into the swing of things where it's almost forced on you. And so it's really cool to like get back into that mindset, except for when uh, Hicks is shaking four different pitches and I can see the clock in the background and he just pitches before I see him even agree to a pitch and it's one Oh two and just absolutely (laughs) blows. Then it's like, then it's like, "Ah, I wish I would have called timeout or maybe had another second where he could have taken his time to get the pitch he wanted, you know? Speaking of speaking of four point oh being average or elite down to first base, I think four point two is MLB average. What are you at these days, Yaz? Do you know? God, I don't know. I mean, am I am I chugging for a hit or am I? Yeah, trying to beat out an infield single. Base? You can I smell it. Still, yeah, I can still maybe pop a four three down the line. You know, <laughs> I'm not. You know, just give it a little good effort. How many? I mean, I guess we've covered all the rules at this point. How many stolen bases can we expect from you this year? We haven't gotten a ton in your career. You're sitting on zero. I need, I need more from you, Yaz. I need. Can we get to like ten this year? You think? Uh, yeah, I can try. You know, I just gotta <laughs> let's have a conversation with some of these uh, pitchers and catchers. You know, just give me a little opportunity. <laughs> I'm just, I'm gonna hold up a zero for a little bit and then just absolutely backdoor like ten for you right at the end and. We'll, we'll solidify it. When you get to you get to the halfway mark of the season, then you can really lock in as pitchers and be like, well, this guy's not going to run. And that's when you're going to take off and get like 20 bags in go. the second half. I like that. Yep. I like yeah. that a lot. Within, within a one-week span, 20 bags. There you go. <laughs> Which also means you're getting on base with a ton of knocks. So I'm all for, I'm all for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm in on that. Yeah. So sure. this offseason, you mentioned kind of a, a total shift of – not a total shift, just kind of getting back to – the basics for you offensively in the off season. Are you like, do you work with anybody? Do you have a coach? Are you heading with other big leaguers? Who, who do you work with in the off season? So I work out at Vandy. So I live, you know, 10 minutes down the road and Corbs has an open door policy where anyone who's played is always welcome back. And right. so I'll work out with uh, Kirk Casale a lot. Tony Kemp, Adam Frazier's down there. Sean Murphy was there this year, which was cool. Yeah. Fun to have him. Um, and then I'll work with Bax. You know, Mike Bax was their hitting coach, and he's someone who's really, really – I guess he really introduced me to what it was like to train as a pro player. He was the older guy when I was first starting to work out, always had me tag along with him. I was always learning from him, and he's still an unbelievable resource to bounce ideas off. And we we think very similarly when it comes to – the fundamental swing. And so that's really helpful. I love, I, I love the thought of all the guys, like all the college guys getting back and being able to work out there. I feel like the Tigers organization was the breeding round of Vandy guys. Like we drafted <laughs> yeah. so many, uh, is Connor Harrell ever around by the way? Do you ever see him anymore? Yeah, I saw, um, I see Connor every off season. He, uh, he just moved out of Nashville though. He was in Nashville, just moved back to, to Houston. So oh, wow. he, uh, yeah, so we'll uh, we'll miss him in Nashville, but we'll still obviously stay in touch and get together a lot. Our uh, our careers, yeah, is kind of well, they've gone in very opposite directions at this point. You're now a big <laughs> leaguer, and I talk about the game, but they started off very similar. We were drafted in the same round, 14th round, in the same year. Went to the New York Penn League, and then they really got closer when we played with each other in the the All Star game in our first season, and. I need to talk to you about the New York Penn League because it doesn't exist anymore. It's now gone, which makes us feel older, I guess. It's like the league we started in is gone. But I personally have so many stories from the Penn League that are like, this is the epitome of minor leagues. So I'm going to give you a second to think of one. I need your best Penn League story that epitomizes what it's about. But mine will forever be, I get drafted, playing professional baseball. I show up and I'm like, this place is awesome. You know, I'm playing pro baseball. Dodge Stadium was great in Connecticut. It was big. It used to be AAA for the Yankees. It's like now I'm a professional athlete. And our first road trip, we went on the road to Vermont, the Lake. Oh, uh, so I knew it was going to be Vermont. <laughs> I knew the second. <laughs> <laughs> we go on the road to Vermont 
And we show up into the locker room, and I was like, well, where's the actual locker room? Like, this can't be it. It was – the floors were dirt. Like yeah. it was disgusting. You needed to take a shower after your shower because you were even dirtier after the game. The field was all lopsided and lumpy in the outfield. And I, that was my first road trip. And I, I got back home at, or in the hotel after that, which was probably like a Ramada Inn, and was like, mm -hmm. man, what it maybe, maybe pro ball isn't all, isn't the most glamorous after all. So turns out you really need to work your way up the ladder before it gets yeah. super glamorous. Burlington is a sneaky sleeper city though. Very sneaky. Good college <laughs> yeah. town, good place yeah. to go out, grab some dinner and drinks after with your team. Terrible visiting locker room because that's actually my story too. So that was the first place that I showed up to. <clears throat> and at Vandy, Corbs makes sure that everything is so like pristinely clean. Like unbelievable. It's like it's cleaner than my own house, than everything. So we never needed shower shoes. It wasn't a thing. Like it was, it was cleaner than showering in our own shower. So I show up to Vermont and have no idea that shower shoes are even a thing. Like I didn't know they existed. And so I'm walking around, I'm like get, about to get dressed and I'm like, uh, I'm, I guess I got to go barefoot. Like I, it's what I've always done. And so I'm barefoot and I'm about to go shower and everyone's looking at me like, Hey, what are you doing? Don't go in there. You need like, I was just like, ah, I don't have a choice. And so I think, uh, I think Jimmy Akabonis gave me his, uh, his shower shoes after he, after he showered and let me borrow them. And I went out and got some the next day. So that was almost a bad, <laughs> bad mishap. I remember, uh, facing that guy and, the he was in Aberdeen and now he's a big leaguer yeah. as well. He threw the other day. He's doing great with the, the Mets, right? Yeah. He was over here the other night. We were talking about that all-star game. Um, we had some we had some good stories from from the minor leagues. We played together at every level, and yeah, uh, it was the Penn League was fun, man. I actually really enjoyed it. Yeah, I I really did as well. There's a million stories to take away, but as you you know, you kind of mentioned it. Wherever you went, like there was a there was a positive to it. Like you know, in in Burlington, it was a great place that you could go out and grab dinner, and the crowd was good. Mm -hmm. The stadium sucked but that's kind of the thing of the minor leagues like there's going to be a negative and there's going to be a lot of positives and great stories along with it i'll also no, not to keep going down this this story route but as you'll remember that locker room in vermont is under like this old football field bleachers yeah. like it's like an outhouse almost and it's and, like the high school bleachers that you can like see through too you know yeah <laughs> like it, you could fall through it's legitimately yeah. high school bleachers so one after one game we had obviously you know kangaroo court and bang box and all that stuff so for those that are listening that don't know kangaroo court is something in a locker room ba basically the players holding the players accountable if you do something that you, you shouldn't be doing you get fined for it well our first rounder uh the year before me his name is austin shots and i forget what he had done during the game but something that like maybe like ran back to the dugout after a strikeout which is just a big no-no just didn't look good <laughs> <laughs> so after the game, there's really nothing to do in that locker room. I'll remember it like it was yesterday. We went under those bleachers and under the football stadium bleachers, put him up on a pole and we taped him to the pole underneath the <laughs> high school football bleachers. And he just had to stay there while we like all got ready and got ready to leave. And he was just taped I love out that. there. Yeah. Great times. Great, great memories out there. Um, but as I mentioned, yeah, as our careers sort of like you skyrocketed through the organization, I got trapped in the Florida state league. You ultimately end up getting that call to the big leagues, which is something I like talking to everybody about that comes on because it's a call everybody wants. Um, I got close to, didn't get it. So I love talking to guys about the story. So walk me through your call to the big leagues, how it happened. Uh, was it a surprise? I want to know the story. It, it was a, a big surprise. We had a, uh, I was staying out in Sacramento and we were supposed to get on a bus at four o'clock in the morning and head to Albuquerque, I believe. Four o'clock. And so I'm at a host family's house and I set up one of my buddies, Sam Selman, with, uh, with their like brother. And so he's staying right down the street from me. We're carpooling to the field. So I'm set up to get a ride from him to the field at 3.30 in the morning. And for some reason, I couldn't sleep. And so it's 1230. And I'm like, this is going to be brutal. Get a call. And it's from a number in Oregon. And I'm like, 
man, I don't know anyone in Oregon. Why, why are they calling me with telemarketing at 1230 at night? That's just so annoying. And I realized I was like, they're not going to be calling me on telemarket at 1230 at night. And our managers from Oregon and I don't have his number because I've been in the organization for five weeks. And I was like, <laughs> I was too quiet and too reserved to really figure that out. And so I was like, maybe I should answer this. So I pick it up and it's Brundy and he's, you know, kind of gives me the whole scenario. He says, Hey, you know, I wish I could do this in person. This is the call you've been waiting for your whole life, but you're going to the big leagues tomorrow. Nice. And I was like, start, I just kind of was silent and I didn't know what to say. And he goes, yeah, you're, uh, you're starting in left field tomorrow, hitting seventh. And there's going to be a car to pick you up to take you to San Francisco at seven o'clock in the morning. And I was like, oh, okay, this is, I'm going to feel terrible tomorrow, but all right. <laughs> so I call up Selman and he's awake for some reason. And I was like, Hey, uh, I don't need a ride tomorrow. He goes, why not? I go, Oh, I'm going to the big leagues. He goes, Oh buddy, I'll be right over. So he rides his bike over and he's like, let's, let's drink some whiskey. And so we have a glass of whiskey at like one o'clock in the morning. That's I got to go awesome. play at seven. And uh, those are, those are the moments that you don't forget, you know, like really yeah. good friends that just like, he has no, no reason to come over and show up, but he made that moment so much more special. Uh, you know, especially since my wife wasn't out there yet, my mom wasn't out there. So it was really cool to to have someone to share that with. So it's the middle of the night. What are your what are your phone calls look like? Was anybody awake for you to call and tell? <laughs> I I woke my wife up. She thought something was wrong. She was like panicking. <laughs> uh my mom was even further away on East coast time. So it was like four in the morning there. By the time I got to call her, she had to try and figure out how to get on a flight. It was, yeah. it was chaos. So by the time you called her, it was 4 AM East coast and you were starting that night in San Francisco. That afternoon. It was a, it was an afternoon game. Did she make so it? it was one, yeah. They both, they both made it. They both <laughs> hopped on like 6 AM flights and got out there, made it just in time. They're troopers. Jeez. So it wasn't, too long into your big league career, Yaz, that you end up in Fenway, which is obviously such a special place for you and your family. And you hit a home run early in that series. And then the very next day was a moment that, I mean, it has to be so special to you, but your grandpa, Carl Yastrzemski, gets to throw out the first pitch back in Fenway. And you, as a visiting player, get to catch the first <laughs> pitch. How awesome was that moment for you guys? Uh, that was probably the coolest moment that I'll ever be a part of. You know, you always say when you're a kid, you know, could you imagine playing catch with your dad, your grandfather, your uncle, you know, you're someone like that on a big league field. And the fact that we got to do it before a game as the first pitch, uh, I don't know. It was, it was really special, really hard to describe. God, that's so cool to see. If you're watching, you can see it right now on the screen. So how how did this idea, like whose idea was it? Were you told like the day before that it was happening or was it kind of in the plans leading up to that series? Yeah, they uh, they asked me if I would want to do it. And I was like, you realize I'm not the one that has to say here. Like, this, <laughs> it's not up to me. Like, you either tell me I'm doing it or or we're not doing it. So I was like, if if my grandfather wants to do it, then – yeah, I'll absolutely do it. But uh, I thought there was no chance he was going to want to do it, but it was really cool. I know Avi, you never got to, to watch him play. Obviously, his career ended uh, before you were right. born. But I'm sure throughout your life growing up, there were some cool moments that you got to be a part of because of him. Maybe they're at Fenway or wherever. What What's a, a memory you look back on as a kid with your grandpa that sticks out? Well, one that's not really necessarily with him, but because of him is uh, I missed my first varsity baseball game mm -hmm. because every year I would, you know, it was a tradition that my mom started when I was young, but she'd let me go to a half day of school and we'd go to the game for opening day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was just, I did it every year. I kind of told the school like, Hey, this is something that I do just to give you guys a heads up. Like I'm not just blowing school off. It's like literally a family tradition. And so it just happened to be the first day of our game, our first game. So we go into the game and I was like, all right, I'm going to go to the first half of the game, leave, make sure I can get to the game on time. And my car gets blocked in by Dwight Evans. And so <laughs> because we got to park in the player parking lot because my grandfather was there for some like pregame ceremony. So we got to do this whole thing. 
So I get to my first varsity game in the ninth inning, and I'm like sweating bullets, like so <laughs> nervous. Like I'm going to get kicked off the team. All the guys are going to hate me, blah, blah, blah. I tell my coach, I was like, hey, I'm really sorry. He's like, you told me you were going to be here on time. And I was like, yeah, well, I was, but my car got blocked in and I, I couldn't move it. And he's like, what do you mean? Like, where were you? I was like, well, Dwight Evans parks behind us <laughs> and like they couldn't find him. And so they didn't have his keys. And he just kind of like his jaw kind of like slowly dropped. And he was just like, OK, like that, you know, I know that's such a ridiculous story that <laughs> yeah. I know you would make that up. And so he pinch hit me in the ninth inning and I popped up to short. Terrible at that, deservedly so. But it'd be I was really thinking this story leads to the perfect ending of you pinch hitting and hitting a walk off for your <laughs> first off. high school. <laughs> but apparently, apparently that's not the ending it, that I was. No, getting. it ended more uh more on the basis of karma, you know? Yeah, absolutely. No, that's great. Never fails. Uh so one thing that, you know, with with my brother and we both have very unique last names that, that hold a lot of weight in the baseball world, but Justin's my brother, but he's still nine years older. Obviously the gap is quite larger between you and your grandpa, but I guess th throughout my life, I've really never been able to accomplish something without at least like hearing or being compared to my brother for, for better or for worse. I've made it for better throughout my life just because I've always gotten it, but I guess I, I, there are some similarities between you and I in that aspect. And I, I wonder for you personally, has it ever been hard for you or something you've had to think about and deal with having the last name Yastrzemski where you're constantly compared to a baseball player that is one of the greatest of all time? I think it was, it was a lot harder when I was a kid, Yeah, <clears throat> you know, because I don't have a – realistic view of what he actually did so i'm like oh you know as a kid you have this big pipe dream i want to be a hall of famer i want to do you know i want to win world series i want to play for this long i want to play for this team and i think it was probably i understood how hard it was to play in the big leagues when i was in high school and college but i i didn't grasp the magnitude of what he did until i turned 23 and that was how many years he played in the big league. So I'm like thinking about this realistically. I'm like my entire life, he showed up to the same field every single day. And I couldn't, I couldn't really like fathom how long that actually was. And so it rattled me. Like I, at that point, I never worried about what anyone said. I was like, I, I understand that I cannot do that and I will never do that. And I'm not trying to do that. Yeah. And so when people are like, I love when people chirp me in the stands and they're like, your grandfather was so much better. I'll turn and look and I'll be like, yes, he is. Yeah. I understand that. Like, I agree with you. He is so much better than I will ever be. That's exactly. I remember uh, one game in the minor leagues, we were playing in Dunedin in the Florida state league. And I don't know what happened. I probably went over four and punched out, but I'm walking back to the dugout. And I mean, this happened, I'm sure it's happened to you many, many times, but people just scream like, you're not you're not the best Verlander and it's like well no shit my brother is a hall of famer and one of the best of all time <laughs> of course I'm not I'm just trying to be the best baseball player I can be I can't yeah. compare myself to him if I do I'll never be near as good <laughs> yeah like why can't I just be like a subpar big leaguer what's wrong with that you know? <laughs> what's wrong <laughs> with an average to below average big leaguer which you know I didn't get to but you know what's yeah. wrong with being an average minor league baseball player come on did you watch um, the golf Netflix series? Yeah, First full swing. swing. Yeah, or full swing. Yeah, so it's it's the Joel Dahman perspective. You know, it's like yep. somebody has to be the seventieth best golfer in the world. <laughs> Might as well be me. You know, like that's okay. Like that's a great place to be in. It's a it's also a great like mental place to be to just be like completely accepting of everything you do well and everything you don't do well. It's it's just a, a very calming place to to sit and enjoy life and when you when you get into that mindset, you probably enjoy the smaller things in life a lot more and you let those big things go. Yeah. I, I think, I think it had to get to a certain point where it's just like, obviously when you're, when you're younger, those things can get to you. And I try to have the career that, especially with, with my brother, like I don't know the career he's going to have to that point. So I'm constantly just right. thinking everything I accomplished along the way has been accomplished by my brother already. So things become, trickier and trickier and I, I remember this specifically my parents were very good at this because every step along the way 
they've kind of when I signed to uh, to play D1 baseball my parents like step made me step back and be like this is really cool to me it was just like the next step in the journey the day of the draft I remember thinking like this is I've always wanted to be a professional baseball player this is just the next step in the journey and my parents again were like you just got drafted to play professional baseball after your junior year of college where you were an all-american like soak it in and I remember Justin having that same conversation with me so I think as I've gotten older and older I've learned to separate things and just allow my accomplishments to be my accomplishments and not let everybody in the stands yelling at me for going over four be 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 a burden on me yeah there's there's only one person that can diminish your accomplishments and it's yourself and if you don't don't let yourself get to that point then you know you can always move forward and appreciate those moments and you can't just let someone who's jealous or is yelling at you because they want to be yelling at themselves, yeah. but they don't have the ability to do that. And you just can't let that affect you. And, you know, we've just had to work on it more than others. Yeah. You know, we've had, had people who want to just say something just to say something. Yeah. Who had Ben Verlander and Mike Yastrzemski having a great heart to heart during this conversation, just having some good life lessons for everyone. What a good conversation. So that's what this podcast does. You that's, know? that's just what we do. It's just what we do. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned along your journey, obviously Vanderbilt, which is a top tier division one college baseball program. And I was thinking about it as we were talking about the minor leagues and you going from Vandy straight to the New York Penn league. I, I guess I want to ask in terms of, I mean, so for those that don't know, the draft happens in the middle of a season, basically in the middle of a professional season. So the New York Penn league is where the majority of draft guys go at least up to a you know the the top at the time there were like 40 some rounds so the top 20 25 round guys go to the New York Penn League so for you it had to be even a little different going from Vandy a top tier to a place like the New York Penn League where it can be hit or miss on where you're playing but in terms of like making that switch in the middle of a season college to there competition wise how was it just in terms of the overall experience like how does it compare to the Vanderbilt experience as well? Um, it's different because uh, there's there's like no supervision, right? Yeah. So you have, you have people that are holding you accountable to your actions in college because you're representing the university, you're representing your families. There's things that they need to keep a hold of. And in pro ball, it's like you're, you're just on your own. Yeah. And you're trying to make a career. Everybody in that locker room is – trying to one up the guy next to them which brings this crazy dynamic in because you're supposed to be a team you're supposed to be winning together but for a lot of guys that doesn't matter and so there's just a mesh of different characters personalities and you're just you're like thrown into this washing machine of new information all based on the same game that you've always played for your whole life which is kind of hilarious because you you build this foundation of here's who I want to be as a player, who's here I want to be as a teammate, and then it can get flipped upside down so quickly yeah. because you've never experienced anything like pro ball before. I've always said those are when, – when people ask the biggest differences between college and pro ball, one I say is 92-mile-an-hour fastballs from college turn into 92-mile-an-hour sliders that move like three feet in pro ball just like yeah. at the snap of a finger. But second, and this is probably – this was probably the most difficult for me was – college baseball was was the time of my life because it's it really is like a, a family and you do everything for each other and then the second you get to pro ball at least until the big leagues where you are now as much as the organization tells you it's it's all about you and it's all about the stats and they can say like you're a team we want you to win well no they don't they they want to see who they have in the minor leagues and it becomes like almost this selfish feeling that I hated and I played better when I was playing for the guy to my left and the guy for my right. But then you get to pro ball and it's all about you. You almost find yourself like not wanting your friend and teammate to play better than you. It was a very difficult part of pro ball. Yeah, it you uh, you find yourself, especially like at night if you have a bad game and you're just like wallowing in your emotions and, you know, you're in a bad stretch, you're in a bad hole and your buddy's having a great day. He's like, Hey, let's go out. Let's have a good time. I'm like, no, man, I don't want to talk to anyone. I <laughs> yeah. don't want to be anyone. But then like the day will switch and it's like, Hey, let's go out. And he goes over four and he doesn't want to go out. You know, you just have these like weird 
you have these weird interactions, but uh, that's what I got so lucky with when I was drafted with the Orioles is the draft class that I was in was like all college guys. Yeah. Everyone was super cool. We're all tight still. Like when I played Jimmy last week, he came over. We just hung out for a couple nights. Uh, Justin Veely was on that team. He's yeah. my hitting coach now, um, which is one of the crazier things to think about. Um, you know, you, you come up with a guy and you expect yourselves to be like playing in the big leagues together. And now, you know, he's my hitting coach and it's super cool. Really, really fun. Just you telling a story about like you go for four, you don't want to go out. And then the next night you go two for four, you're fine going to dinner and the other guy's not. I remember, uh, one of my minor league stops, we had a, we all went out to dinner and we played credit card roulette because nobody has any money. So it's like, we're all just going to put our card in and hope and pray that we're not the card picked and whoever's card is picked has to pay, pay for it all. The one guy that he didn't want to come to dinner, he was like, Oh, for his last 17 with 12 strikeouts. And you know where this is going. We all put our cards in and his gets picked. And I was like, I cannot like, I felt awful. You're like, just the- take mine please just take it like (laughs) someone fix this yeah absolutely so your career ends up taking you to the Giants organization where you are now super deep rooted history tons of legends throughout and I guess once you get there you hadn't been in the minors for too long before you get called up is there are there guys that maybe older vets or legends from the organization that kind of either took you or are still taking you under their wing to to help you in your career uh, I think one of my, like, very – obviously, Boach was huge, and he was the first manager I ever played for, and he just let me learn the game when I needed to instead of either, you know, burying me with, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. He would let me know. He'd say, he's you know, I'd come in and say I get picked off. He'd just be like, wave me over. Hey, that can't happen. And i go, I know. And he goes, all right. Don't let it happen again. Yeah. And that's it, you know, and let me learn from it instead of like saying why I couldn't do it or why it was a mistake. He let me figure those things out. But also Ron Wotus is an absolute legend. Um, you know, he's, he's still around and he's really fun to hang out with. And he's just a, such a brilliant baseball mind. He's been around the game for so long and there's always something to talk to him about, whether it's, you know, base running base stealing fielding hitting approach yeah you know what kind of wine we need to drink after the game what, whatever yeah. you want you know like what was, what was your guy and it's i've been really really fortunate to be around some of those guys another guy from that organization that i think you have uncanny similarities to big left-handed hitting outfielder tons of power one of the best power hitters of all time, Barry Bond slash Mikey Stremski. Is he ever <laughs> yeah. around? Have you ever talked to him about hitting? Yeah. Um, I've, I've gotten to talk to Barry a bunch of times actually. So he, uh, he's not a guy that I ever expected to meet. Um, you know, I always loved watching him play, loved watching what he does and, you know, arguably the best hitter of all time. I yeah. think it's when you look at his, his stats and, they they're beyond video game stats it's, like yeah the, it's a game OPS in 04 whatever it was like 1400 is <laughs> like guy like the player of the week every or the player of the week the player of the month in every voting never hits that in that one little time span but he did it for a whole year in multiple years i was just like i don't i, don't, I can't even comprehend what that must have felt like <laughs> that's ridiculous uh all right yeah. he has couple of questions for you, fun questions before we finish up. First of which being, take your stadium out of it because Oracle's probably my favorite oh. stadium. I love it. But yeah. when you go on the road, what is your favorite place to play and visit? So far, it's been Coors Field. Um, hard, you know, it, it is a bummer to not say Fenway, but um, I get a lot more exposure to Coors and I've played very well there. So I, I enjoy hitting there a lot. What about a least favorite? Least favorite? Uh, probably the Coliseum. <laughs> That's like 95% of guys yeah, say the I, Coliseum. They also like, what um, What are those things in the, like in Sedona? Like they have like those vortexes. It's like, uh, it's like, a, you know, 
it's almost like there's like a spirit there with you when you're at the Coliseum. You know, like <laughs> I feel like I'm in this daze and I feel like I'm not I'm not where I'm supposed to be. Something's going on like foggy. I can't see any. I was like, I don't know. Man. There's, there's 50 weird. fans in the stands and it's yeah, like, where, where am I? <laughs> I think I'm three. I'm like half in a dream and I'm like, I don't know. It's, it's one of those weird, weird scenarios where I just don't feel right. <laughs> yeah. That's what the, the majority of guys either answer that or just somewhere that they're like one for 30 in their big league career. That's the only yeah, other time you get an answer. That's out. also another good reason to not like a place. <laughs> uh, all right. Last one for you. If Mike Yastrzemski was anything other than a major league baseball player, what are you? Mm, I'd love to be a, uh, a professional, like, like a sponsored surfer, Whoa. like surfer, people, you know, are you good? You go, no, I'm terrible, but I, <laughs> I, I love it. Like it'd be, it'd be, I love being in the water. I grew up around the ocean. I mean, I would, I would surf every day if I could. Um, and so I think that'd be one of the coolest things to like travel to all these tropical places, the most beautiful places in the world. Red Bull pays for it, you know, <laughs> That, it sounds like a great gig. That's great. Well, I'm glad you are a Major League Baseball player and killing it this <laughs> year. I hope you kill it for the whole year, my friend. Good luck the rest of the way. Always fun having you on, Mike. Always fun. Thanks for having me, Ben. It was awesome. Of course. I appreciate it. Good, good luck rest of the year, my friend. Thanks. All right. I just wanted to thank Mike Yastrzemski again for joining me. Always a blast of a conversation with him. I love that guy. Love the stories we tell. I could sit here for hours and hours and tell minor league baseball stories and to have him on and be able to do it with him and get his stories as well is always a blast hearing him talk about Barry Bonds with the in my opinion the greatest hitter of all time and in his opinion as well getting to talk to him about hitting and of course who had us having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation about our last names and um, what's come up from that in, in our lives. That was truly an awesome conversation with the guy. And I, I'm a huge fan of his and have been since we were teammates in that first all-star game together back in 2013. So thank you again to Mike Yastrzemski for joining me. And thank you all for listening to this conversation. Make sure you're subscribed wherever you listen. Flippin' Bats Pod, wherever you listen to your podcast. Apple, Spotify, wherever. Subscribe, hit that plus button. We're also on all social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and you can watch every episode as well on YouTube at Flippin' Bats Pod for all of them. That does it for another episode of Flippin' Bats. Thank you all for listening, and until next time, peace.